Welcome, everybody, to the Finding Hermes podcast. I hope you're ready to lay your cards on the table and go through the door with the God of the mind and find out your purpose and who you truly are. And with us today, uh, very excited uh, to have Jill Thomas for a very hypnotizing interview. And I'm sure you've never heard of that fun before, right? Not not one time. You're the only one. <laughs> I'm the only one who figured it out. Yes, right. Yes. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll go in denial about that and believe that because my ego needs help, huh? Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Really, uh, really enjoyed your book, and uh, we definitely want to expand on your book and all these other ideas that you have and what you're doing. But first of all, tell us, Jill, your superhero story from Ooh, my going superhero to a Clark Kent to uh, Supergirl, I guess. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. I, years ago when I was in high school, I went to a, a one of those hypnotist shows and I watched, and I remember this guy, Marshall Silver. I still remember. He's kind of famous. I watched Marshall Silver make the most popular kids in the school do some of the stupidest things I'd ever seen. And I remember, I remember watching it and I think, I want in. I want in. This is this superpower. I want it. So I took all of his seminars. Of course, back then, I'm not going to tell you my age, but it was old enough that these were on video. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to go to his seminar, but my mom, uh, for some reason, thought uh, going to Las Vegas with an, a much older man was not a good idea for her 19-year-old to be doing. So I, I ended up with a, a, an actual career too. But an, always in the side, I was always doing hypnosis because it was so much fun and discovered that stage hypnotism is very different than the stuff that you do to help people quit smoking and get over their fears. And I love the idea with hypnosis that it's really like getting into the programming code of a computer and making some changes. So if you don't want something, if you want to add something, you want to take something away, with hypnosis, we can actually get into that initial coding and make those changes and make the preferred behavior be more automatic, if that makes sense. But that's my superhero story. I started off learning from someone who really was a superhero. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we before we definitely want to get into the income healer, but maybe talk a little bit about hypnotism, because again, uh, as I've mentioned on the show, uh, hypnotism really helped me, uh, especially I think when was it? It was yeah, it was my last uh, drug relapse more than a decade ago, but my mind was a complete mess. And I knew from my years of when I was in recovery, that uh, meditation is the way to, you know, get yourself focused. But my mind was so fragmented and destroyed from the drugs. Hypnotism was just the perfect hack because it's so guided and it's step by step. So I, it really helped me. And people say, well, you didn't have any money while well, I was doing apps. I was doing YouTube videos. Whatever, you know, you do what you have to do until you can build on that foundation. But anyway, um, what you said, stage hypnotism and sort of the healing hypnotism that I embrace after my last relapse, what's the difference? Stage hypnotism is supposed to be uh, for display. First of all, the people that, that get picked, it's not going to be someone like me or even, maybe even someone like you. It's going to be someone who's like, oh, pick me, pick me, I want to be a <laughs> They'll do whatever batshit crazy thing that the person on stage wants to do. I wouldn't. So I'm not going to even fall for that, right? But somebody else who wants to be in the public eye will actually kind of in a way hypnotize themselves and get themselves into it, in, into a place without the person on the stage actually having to do that much work. Also, stage hypnotism is meant to be temporary. It's meant to be something that just goes for a little while. You bark like a dog, you cluck like a chicken, and then you go home and you have normal life, right? What I do is meant to be at a deeper level of trance, and it's supposed to be forever. That's what we want. That's the ideal. So it's, it's really a different type of thing. It's, the, it's an important distinction because some of the most intelligent clients will tell me they don't think it's going to work because they weren't picked on the stage for these shows. And I can tell you that even though I am very easily hypnotized, I would never be picked because I'm just not going to do it. I'm just not going to do that stuff. I would now peace out. And I've watched those shows where people who were clearly hypnotized, who were in trance, got pushed off 
you know, oh, you're not, you're not hypnotized. And I'm like, that person totally is. But it's because they weren't playing along well enough. They just, maybe they didn't have that stage presence. For a show, you are looking for a specific person, just like a producer of a TV show. They want the person who's going to put on the best show. And that's the person that gets picked. So if you're not picked, it doesn't mean you can't be hypnotized. It just means you weren't picked. That's what it means. That makes sense. Yeah, you have to. Uh, so they're looking for the right person because uh, there was a, I did some research and there was uh, some stage magician. I'm not good with names, but he always talked about the best people to fool for magic tricks are the intelligent people. He would like to he would pick a Nobel uh, Prize winner for any because he knows that they will he, he can use their ego against them. And their ability to only see what they want to see is what makes it. So in hypnotism is the same thing. They already know who that person is or the character type or profile. Probably, as you said, somebody really energetic whose energy is flowing in adrenaline and you can sort of just manipulate. I guess that's what you, you ever notice too how they, they tend to pick really pretty people. I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's weird how it works. In life, they're picking the really pity people. I don't know why. Almost like a, almost like a TV show. And I'm sure a lot of these. Uh, what, but uh, are any of these, as far as you know, like hucksters that planted the person there, or? I mean, that would be that? great. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think I don't need to. I don't know why you would do that. You just don't need to because it's, it's not that hard to hypnotize somebody to do a stage show, especially in a big show when there's a big audience of people to choose from. I can't imagine there the, the person would actually need to, but I, you know, have I, do I think it's never happened? Uh, probably happened, but I just don't think it's necessary. And this day they'll get caught on social media. Somebody's going to talk. Totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and that makes sense. Uh, the idea of the egregore where, if you're in a church or an audience, there is an energy, uh, almost like a, a tulpa, a mass tulpa. And of course, whether you're a faith healer or a carnival head or a rock star like Elvis, you know how to use that energy for your own purposes. So a good show hypnotist probably does that. He can use the, the audience energy to maximize his powers right absolutely <laughs> this magic power it, it, it does look like magic but you don't know how the game is played i mean it, it's, it's pretty cool even if you do know how the game is played it looks like magic it's awesome it's fun <laughs> just looking behind the, the the matrix code all right well let's talk about uh regular hypnotism what exactly is it and what are some of the myths in the modern vernacular people have about uh, hypnotism as a therapy I love what you just said initially about how it was like meditation, only it was guided. It's like meditation, only it's guided. It is basically <laughs> meditation. And instead of saying, hey, imagine silence, which means you're going to be imagining everything but silence. It's imagining certain things, imagining a world uh, that is free of uh, drug implication, imagining a world where you're looking at the consequences of your actions rather than how much fun it would be to take those actions. Imagine a world where an airplane is the safest place you could go and it and going to see grandma is going to be so much fun. And, and that, that two hours, it's no big deal. You could totally do that. So it is really just meditation. And I will also say that even a very light state of trance can be very, very effective. That's one of the reasons, I, don't, I think it was Walmart. I shouldn't even say this because they might sue me. I think it was Walmart, though. If you, eh, 30 years ago, got in trouble for subliminally playing music that was going to try and get people to buy stuff. It might not have been Walmart. I'm pretty sure it was, though. Anyway, it didn't work. But that's the whole idea is that if you're going to put something in it, it, you know, music will put somebody in a light state of trance and the subliminal mm. messages were intended to get people to buy more stuff. I I don't really think it actually worked, but I remember that being on the news when I was younger. So, you know, that's that's part of it. In terms of myths, the number one myth I hear all day long, I hate to say this, is that idea that intelligent people can't be hypnotized. My favorite clients are the scientists and the engineers because I find them to be incredibly easy to hypnotize. <laughs> you actually have to be more intelligent to be able to do this because intelligence really is the ability to focus for a long period of time on one thing. I mean, just imagine a, a software engineer, programmer, right? You have a lot of clients, I'm sure, who are that. They focus so intently on this game that the whole world disappears and time simply goes by. That is part of the hypnotic gift. You have to be able to focus like that in order to get into a deep state of trance and do serious healing. So I would say that's the biggest myth that interferes with people going and getting help, which I find really sad because people will say, well, 
I watch a commercial and I don't buy the product, it's not going to work on me. Yeah, I don't either. But that doesn't mean that because you're really intelligent, it's not going to work. It actually is the opposite. And the other one that we should probably address is that of the idea that it is some sort of mind control. In other oh, words, Jill can't make her <laughs> client unconsciously go and rob a bank and leave a pile of money at her doorstep. You can't Honestly, <laughs> I can't even make a client do something they really want to do sometimes, right? I wish them. it were that more interesting, but no, it's, I can't make you do anything you don't want to do, which is why, honestly, if somebody's, and this happens a lot, I'm not going to lie, this happens a lot, somebody's spouse books a session for their partner for smoking cessation. And the person who doesn't want to quit smoking is not happening. I, I don't even bother. I like, if you really don't want to quit, let's work on something else. Let's work on something happiness. I'm not going to tell them we didn't work on smoking, but that's why if, if you don't want to have it happen, it's not going to happen. I wish it was mind control. It would actually be easier. You have more better case studies out there to totally. put on your website, yeah. you know, I know. Yeah, and you were talking about, um, well, I don't know how to couch this, uh, the unconscious and the conscious. For example, something that helped me again was when I first started out, you know, my last drug relapse. Uh, I was like, well, hypnotism would work or not. And I remember reading somebody or watching somebody and he said, look, uh, hypnotism is in essence uh deep concentration paired with a very focused relaxation or the other way focus relaxation whatever you want to call it. it's two states of being and he made the example you know when you get in the car and you're driving and you're so like you said the engineer you're so focused on a problem i need to do this if i can figure this out and you're you're in this amazing state and suddenly you go oh my god i just i just drove myself to the grocery store i didn't notice any lights streets is that kind of is you're in sort of this dual state of mind? It is it, those are actually two different things. What mm. happens with your when you're driving to the, to the car? I love this driving in the car. Uh, you're you've got a habit response going on. Your mm. mind about ninety five, depending on which study it is, ninety five to ninety eight percent of what we do on a daily basis is habit based, which means the mind has set up a belief. The belief is that red stop sign means stop. The belief is the green light means go. All of those beliefs are programmed in so the mind doesn't think have to think about left and right and the different stages to apply the brake. It has to be not too hard because then the car will lurch forward. All of those little things are sort of programmed in so that your mind is free to think about all that worry stuff that you've got going on, right? The, the problem is when those habits, which most of them are, vast majority of them are pretty ordinary, they're just normal. But when the habit is about something that's not healthy, like for example, a lot of times with smokers, they go to a bar and they feel like smoking because they've put those two issues together, right? right? When you've got a habit that is not life enhancing, that's when it becomes an issue. But I love what I love the analogy of it just being deep concentration and deep relaxation at the same time. That's a great way of looking at it. Uh, if you were to say play something uplifting, let's say in your car while you were thinking about a problem, your mind would actually start to go to that beautiful thought or that beautiful message in the in the you know, the radio that you're playing, if you were to do it that way, that would be really helpful. The other thing that's interesting too about driving, I just, this is one little thing. If you have ever driven a stick shift, even if it's been 20 years, when you go to that stop sign, you probably still put your hand on the gear shift. Even if it hasn't, even if you hadn't had a, a regular standard transmission in 20 years, probably still do it. It's a habit. Oh, it is. Uh, this happened last summer. I went back to Portugal and because of all these uh, serious things in my life, it'd been like eight, nine years since I'd gone back, children, deaths, just a lot going on. And uh, obviously in Portugal, every, everybody drives a stick. We get to Portugal. The next day, my seven-year-old daughter goes to my uncle's uh, dog and the dog bites her face oh, and, she's ble and, and uh, we're with my aunt who's a 90, 90 year old retired nun and my other aunt who's also 70 and retired and they're like Miguel drive her to the emergency room and they hand me the keys to the stick to the standard man I was like and I was you know I remembered the way to go and in Portugal it's all mountains like San Francisco mountains and I am with the mm -hmm. stick you know driving at you know 60 miles an hour in little roads with my daughter bleeding and crying and I was like 
wow, how did I remember this? It's like it just like not a day had passed. So yeah, you never lost it. It didn't. Uh, it didn't. That's unfortunately. That's also reason why the drug addiction for you probably came back was because it's a think about it. The neuro pathways is a little bit like freeways. You hadn't mm -hmm. lost, you, you hadn't demolished the freeway exits that said, oh, if I get stressed, I'm going to use this product. You hadn't demolished those freeways. They were still there when you got your stimulus again or when life got hard again, you went back to them and because they, they were still there, which was, it was fortunate for the stick shift, not so fortunate for, a for drug stimulation. Relapse. Yeah, for the relapse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As we say in uh, AA, it's not like, it's not, not a day has passed. You don't, uh, you don't pick up, you just continue. Everything else is just stop. It's a blank. You just join these two days. So it's uh yeah, the mind is an incredible thing. And so how do you how do, can hypnotism help you or maybe tell the audience the mechanism? Is this something are you panning the unconscious for gold? Are you looking for unaddressed trauma, all of the above? I mean, or is it more of a subliminal get your ego and your psyche to be stronger? What's the process, Jill? So there's a whole lot to it. And, and we actually have AA to thank for some of it, right? Because AA actually did a lot of research on this when they were trying to help people figure out how to get rid of the habit of, smoke, of drinking alcohol. So there's a stimulus, um, a trigger, Something happens, life happens, the stop sign. We'll just use the stop sign as the analogy. And then there's the habit. The habit is uh, with the stop sign, you put your foot on the brakes, you stop, and then you feel a sense of relief, which is the payoff. It's the third part of it, the payoff. Sense of relief that you didn't die and then you move on, right? AA did all of that research to come up with the, that model. So we use that model a bit in hypnosis. So with hypnosis, let's say the drug issue. Maybe there's an unconscious belief that happened earlier on in your life. I'd be willing to bet money that there's somebody in your family who had also had some kind of a drug issue. Perhaps you watched it. Perhaps uh, it, part of it may even be a bit inherited, could be in your DNA, a tendency towards addictive behavior, and you maybe saw that modeled in the home. So the unconscious, the little Miguel, little Miguel, I know I was gonna say that wrong. <laughs> little Miguel saw, okay, if something gets stressful, we're just gonna get manic and we're gonna use something to get calm again. That's how we're gonna handle that. And so later on that something ended up being something quite negative for the body and the mind. So in hypnosis, we wanna go back to the original cause of that belief, that original time when little Miguel figured out, this is how we're gonna handle stress or whatever it is that's triggering it. Well, you, have, you ask the client, why does this happen to you? When does this happen? What happens just before? And then you go back to the original cause and you create a different belief. So instead of little Miguel deciding that that manic thing means we're going to grab something to calm down, that manic state means let's go for a jog. Let's go grab a book. Let's go play with the dog. Maybe something more life enhancing. And then that becomes the new habit. And sometimes you have to do it a couple of times. Also, you may have created a belief that you were not worthy of having a happy life and of good things. And that also could have come from family of origin difficult family of origin, unpleasant life could have taught you, or the idea, little Miguel, the idea that he doesn't worth having all of the good things and living to be 85 years old and, and dying by getting hit by a bus. But, you know, something, something happy, like something easy, right? Maybe not, maybe not the bus. <laughs> maybe not the bus, but not, not a heart attack or not um, an addiction issue. Let's put it that way. Make sense? No, it makes sense. Yeah, we want to talk about the worth thing because your book has been great and I've changed, I've been changing my careers and other things so much. There's always the imposter syndrome and the idea of, am I worth it? Am I worth it? But beyond that, that makes sense because with my parents, it was like a double whammy. My, uh, my mom was uh, a manic depressive and I got that really, you know, uh, a rapid cycler manic depressive. My dad just used to get depression and alcohol was the one time that they were nice and happy to me. So, of course, little Miguel, as you said, would be like, there you go. That's the solution to your problem, which, of course, all it does is make the it just pushes the trauma down and makes it worse from all the things that happen. So in a, and for me, you know, a lot of union therapy, like you said, going back, meditating. There's a lot of active imagination where. I go back as little Miguel and I have a chat with him. I have a chat with my dad, you know, I understand why you threw me down the stairs. It's okay, little Miguel, you know, it's not your, you know, you go through this thing, you end up loving them and it becomes like an 80 sitcom instead of a bad childhood because you've worked it out and you know, it, does hypnotism do that? Or are you just trying to 
mitigate habits? It's, it's really both, right? Part of it is the mitigating of the habit. There's a habit that came from the belief. So the mm -hmm. belief in little Miguel's case was that he he's not worthy. And also the manic depressant with your mom is kind of interesting because you saw her behavior. And as a, a child, you would have thought, oh, this is how moms behave. This is normal. You wouldn't have thought, wow, mom's got a mental illness that she should be taking medication no, for. No, they didn't know isn't. It. And yeah, it was like <laughs> one moment, my mom doesn't love me because she's just not there. And the other moment, she's like, great. So you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you thought that was normal. And you also thought it's all your fault, right? Because you had friends who had mothers who were not like that. They didn't act this way. What's different about them? What's different about me? Am I not worthy of love? Am I not good enough? Right. So there's that belief system. So you work on the belief system, but then you also work on how it manifested. In your case, manifesting an addiction process uh, is, is where that came from, but we have to work on both. We got to work on the why and we work on the what. So rather than using product, maybe you go for a run or maybe you use more life enhancing product like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, coffee, something else to get the same response because it's hard to take away that habit. You're not going to take away that stimulus. Life still happens for everyone, yeah. but you've got to figure out how to, how to work it differently so that you're happy. And then a great example of this is the weight loss thing. That's a, an issue I see a lot of people for. Mm -hmm. Can you just make it so I don't like chocolate? Yeah, I could, I could but you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't solve the problem. You're just going to pick up French fries instead. Right. If we, we need to look at why you're not feeling comfortable in the body that you're in, why you're not loving yourself enough to give yourself all of the good things, including a body that is very, very healthy and will live for a long, long time. And also, how are you not getting past your addiction to sugar? And then let's be honest, sugar is really addicting. And they don't want us to think that. They don't want us to know that because it's in 70% of the products that are out there. But it is a major addiction problem that nobody's talking about because it's really the, well, a lot of people are talking about it. It's a slow death. It's not going to kill you today. It's not going to kill you tomorrow. It'll, it takes its time. So that's uh, a big, yeah. big thing that you work with. With hypnosis is, is helping to help, helping a lot of people get past some of the sugar addiction. That one's a tougher one, tougher than coffee. Yeah. As they, they say addiction is suicide in installments. And I'm, I'm yeah, sure I might not be out of, that. I might not be out of the woods, but I'm certainly better than I used to be. That, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. I have to write that one. That was good. That was really good. <laughs> I have to write that down. And is part of the goal, uh, trauma healing. Is that what hypnotism can help you? Because if some have said today, like, uh, Gabor Mate and others, yeah, everything can be traced to trauma. And, you know, uh, it's not the Freudian never can be traced to your mom and dad, although I think Freud was right because those archetypes are powerful and they never go away. But trauma. Well, it's not always trauma. I mean, trauma is actually the root of, of most problems, but not everybody has like real trauma, like the kinds of things that you and I would consider trauma. Some people are just afraid to get on a plane. And maybe that's because they had a bad experience with a plane or they had a relative who had a bad experience or, the, or often with a plane, particularly. Oftentimes the fear of flying is actually about a fear of letting go of control. Mm -hmm. Because when you get on a plane, you can't even use the bathroom unless somebody says it's okay. You can't do anything, right? Somebody else is in control. And if you're in that middle seat, you really have no power, no power. So with hypnosis, it's about being more comfortable with someone else who's better qualified than yourself to fly a plane being in control. And that, that is not always someone who's had trauma. I mean, it's often, but that's not always a trauma, trauma model. Uh, but absolutely, trauma is a, a big thing to help with hypnosis. Uh, but, you you know, just because you think, well, I never had anything traumatic doesn't mean you can't benefit from, from hypnotherapy or from adjusting your habits using hypnosis. And why do you think people have such a strong impulse for control? Again, like getting on a plane and other things. Uh... Honestly, I think a lot of it, and I hate to blame moms over and over again, but it's that loss of power that a lot of times mom, particularly the family of origin, took power away from the child, didn't let them do things, didn't let them eat what they wanted to eat. I, mean, I don't mean eat what you want to eat. You don't let your kids eat Twinkies, but they had power over every aspect of their life. Maybe they were over controlling. Maybe they were overly uh, involved in their kid's life. And the person doesn't like having control taken away from them. That's oftentimes where I see it play out. Uh, it can also be, you know, even just as simple as fight bullies at the schoolyard, pushing a kid down and, and forcing them to be on the ground. And they didn't like that, you know, that kind that can cause that 
trauma. Some of it's mild, some of it's more severe. But that loss of feeling of control is is a really tough one and it's a very common one. And I would say that is really the root cause of fear of flying, fear of driving, fear, fear of driving. Another one that that manifests sometimes as loss of control is actually the fear of the es escalators. I don't see a ton of that, but that does happen sometimes. People get really uncomfortable with these escalators and elevators because they, they have no control. Yeah. I remember going in through a, a dry drunk stage and I was, it, you know, I turned into a control freak. I, I was afraid of uh, not just flying. I was afraid of falling asleep because I, my identity was going to change. And I was like, no, I have to control this because this is what's keeping me sober. Of course, then I realized, yeah, willpower is not the way to go really. to keep you sober or really overcome anything. It's uh, you got to work on other things. For somebody like you, I would recommend finding something else to shift your. It almost sounds like it, it almost sounds like a little bit of an obsessive model. Like find something you're really interested in that you can obsess over. So a healthy obsession, exercise, um, eating healthy, fitness. A lot of these, like quote fit, fitness fanatics, I would think I. I I can't say for sure. I haven't met them all, but I'm going to guess that a number of them are dry drunks because they've, they've just shifted from alcohol as their focus to micromanaging every aspect of the food they put in their body so that they can have a six pack when they're 70, which is awesome, by the way, it's <laughs> awesome. But I would just say that for someone like in that position, find something else that you can get that excited about and focus on that. It's always a hard balance. I mean, it you is. don't because again, you hear people who overdo it with the exercise. Entrepreneurs are so driven; they just screw over the, they screw over their family as much as a, a heroin addict will because they're just destructive. So it's a it's a hard game to play, isn't it? I would say that the person who's screwed over the family is probably narcissistic personality disorder, mm -hmm. which isn't can manifest as alcoholism. But I would say that's kind of a different issue. Um, but yeah, it's a tough one. It's a matter of finding balance. I would never tell someone don't get excited about something because you that's just a it's just a battle you can't win. I'm a, one of those, I believe in fighting the fight you can win. You can't you can't win that battle. Find something that you're passionate about that isn't too crazy, that takes you away from the thing that you were passionate about before that was really very bad for you and for your family. And uh, another myth probably should be addressed, uh, and hopefully people know this by now, you're not going to get cured in the first session. You're not Gandalf or somebody like that. This is, it's an ongoing therapy, right? There's an evolution and an arc to go through. There are some issues that are one and done. I would say a really good hypnotherapist can probably help someone feel better for uh, symptoms of anxiety, usually within one session session but in terms of making it so those symptoms don't come back or helping the person heal whatever cause those symptoms take place in the first place that takes longer but i will tell you there are a few issues that a person can go to a hypnotherapist and only see once oh, gosh i'm thinking of like nail biting like nail you know a lot of times i don't ever have to see those people again it's not it's because they get better and they don't have to come back or i see them for something else right they want to get more confidence because they have to do some public speaking but um there are a few issues where where it can be a one and done so there are some things like that but yes for the most part continuing to get help is is usually beneficial for everything yeah yeah we all need therapy ongoing every human being we're so me complex too. <laughs> me too <laughs> Awesome. And uh, well, let's talk about your book. The, no, before we talk about the income healer, I had another question too. Sure. You work in with past life regression. Yes. Or, uh, tell us about that. Because I have, even though on this show, I've talked about a million times reincarnation and so many shows, so much proof, so much that, but, and I've said this on, on some of the live shows, I've yet to have a past life regression. I have other people I experience other people, but never really in the past. But tell us about that, Jill. Past life regression therapy is very beneficial for some situations. I will say that more so than other issues, this is not a cure for everything. A lot of people read Brian Weiss's book, which is great, Many Lives, Many Masters. And he talks about past life regression therapy and gives some great examples of people that cured like massive problems with one session of a past life regression. That is typically not the experience I've had. Most people's challenges are actually better healed with the with whatever's going on right now. Um, people call me and they think, you know, they want to lose some weight and they think it's a past life. Eh, probably not. 
It's probably probably something you're doing now. But past life regression therapy is really, really interesting is you just have to get somebody into actually a pretty deep state of trance. And then I have them imagine a doorway and they walk through a door and learn something. It's easier if you if there's something specific you're looking for. Like if you, um, Miguel, if you have a tendency towards a skill and you want to understand where it comes from or like something you're fascinated by, maybe you really like uh, warrior stuff or ninja stuff. You want to know if you were a ninja in a past life. Well, if you have a tendency like that, you probably were, and we can help you go back and visit the earlier version of yourself and see those tendencies. But that's kind of the, the gist of a past life regression. Uh, I will say, I will say, if you want to experience it on the cheap, I'm going to tell your people how to experience it on the cheap. Brian Weiss actually has a really cool past life regression CD, and it's like 15 bucks on Amazon. I mean, oh. you, can, you can still call me and book an appointment, but I would say that, that was a really, I, I listened to it myself and go, wow, this is pretty good. So that's a good way to, to at least try it out and people can experience it on, on the cheap. But I still, even when people do past life regressions, they'll come back and say, oh, I think I made all that stuff up. And I really have no way of knowing if they didn't. I have no reason to believe that they did because I believe in reincarnation. I believe that we have lived other lives. But yeah, people do come out of it and saying, I think I made all that up. Or I saw that on an episode of, of Rome. I don't know if you remember that show from HBO mm -hmm. 20 years ago. When that show was on, I got a lot of people saying, hey, I think I saw that last night on Rome. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was happening a lot with those. <laughs> yeah, these days, a lot of people are remembering there were Cathars. That's a big one, too, especially in the occult community. Yeah, and it's interesting because... Uh, and I'm sure this is a type of hypnotism, but I have the when I have these visions, and it'll and it's nothing exciting. I'm not Napoleon or Cleopatra or anybody cool. I'm like I'll have this. I'm just a guy in Alabama walking my kid to my you know to my Pontiac, and we're getting in with some groceries or some something so mundane. But it's so common and real, and the texture is so real. It doesn't, and it's nothing I've ever experienced. It's new. So I wonder, is it uh, past life regression? But it always happens right as I'm falling asleep, the hypnagogic state. Mm -hmm. Is that more or less what hypnotism, you're in between worlds, the conscious and the unconscious, yeah. the, the bardo of the Buddhists? Yeah, so there's different levels of uh, of brainwave states in order to get into the hypnotic state. So as you're, as you're falling asleep, you're actually falling through several states to get to that deep theta state, which is sleep, basically. Uh, but yeah, that's when you would get these flashes of information from a past life. Um, I love that stuff. I will say, whenever History Channel does something on Elizabeth the Great, or there's another guy, I can't think of him. Um, oh, shit, it'll come to me later. But one of these, these big conquerors, warrior conquerors who conquered Europe, every time one of those shows is on, I get calls from people who, is, who think, who say they absolutely are no, they were this guy and they want me to be, bring them into deep trance so they could confirm it. And I have to say, I think it gets a little bit of our ego talk. <laughs> <laughs> Projection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but I will say that all of these people, Queen Elizabeth had a massive entourage of people. So it could have been that one of her ladies in waiting, but I, I will say I do get that call a lot when there's something on some famous person on TV, particularly on the History Channel. I can tell you, Bill... Uh, Josh Gates has done quite a few of these little specials where he's shown about some famous male histor historical figure. And that's when I'll get a phone call. <laughs> I'm sure that I was him. I'm absolutely sure. Attila the Hun. That's the one. Attila the Hun. Uh, Attila oh, the Hun. Uh. I got a lot of guys sticking. They were Attila the Hun in my office over the years. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. So Must far, he has not made an appearance, but. The promise of testosterone. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I enjoy it. Yeah. The, uh, I know. I think I forgot who it was Pablo Picasso or somebody he believed in this hypnagogic state where he could get art and answers to all his life. And he had this trick because when I do it, I fall asleep. And unfortunately you lose 80% of that vision. He would put like a plate on his hand or on his lap. So if he doze off, the plate would fall and he'd wake up and he'd start writing down. I don't do it because then I was like, oh, I'm one of those people. Sometimes if I wake up, that's it. And I'm just like, God, I can't go you know, back honestly, back. I think what he was doing wasn't hypnosis. I think he was channeling it. I think really? a, a higher level being was projecting it through him and he was just tuning in just to the right frequency to sort of get into it. Or perhaps he had a relationship with a being on the other side that was giving him that information. Uh, it's easy to call that hypnosis. And it's not, 
the channeling state isn't that different, but it isn't the same thing. When you have another being transmitting information, usually through writing or pictures or drawing or singing, that type of thing, that is a little bit different than hypnosis, but that, that could very well be what he's talking about. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Well, all these terms work talking about the same thing right we are totally experience, the oceanic state. yeah it's uh yeah meditation this place where we're in between worlds and our ego is kind of like all right let's let's see what i'm the tip of the iceberg and there's an entire world of ancestors and spirits and and angels and demons and it's like it's a pretty cool world and when i meditate i actually like the, the version of myself who's meditating than my real version because yep. he's a better listener. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great. Well, let's talk about the income healer. Tell us about this book. So this book is actually a, I wrote it because during the pandemic, during the pandemic, we all discovered actually it was before the pandemic. We all discovered that we all, all of us need a side hustle, right? So a lot of people from the corporate world we're coming to me who had just gotten their certificates for Reiki, hypnotherapy, um, massage therapy, different little certificates. And they wanted to learn how to do the business because there's very different, it's a different mindset being an employee to being a business owner, as I'm sure you've discovered over the years. It's one thing to be told what to do. It's quite another thing to be in charge of all of those decisions, have to accept the consequences of all of them yourself. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write this book to show people how to take to get out of your own mental headspace and do the things you need to do to own a business. In this day and age, still, very few women own businesses. It's just not that many of them. I mean, 20%, but it's just not, it's a small number compared to, to the men, you know? And a lot of these people who are in the healing arts have never had a parent who owned a business. So they don't have anybody to ask. They don't have a role model to look at. They don't know what to do when a customer gets angry at them and you know is demanding their money back, even though they provided the full service and they shouldn't have to give the money back. This book kind of gets into the step-by-step -step of how to start one of these businesses and make a lot of money. But the other part of it that's really important is how to get past that little voice in your head that says, you're not worthy, you don't deserve, you don't good enough. $100 is a lot of money, you can't charge that. I mean, yeah. I explain how to do it. And also more importantly, the biggest drain I would say on most of these healers is not setting proper boundaries. And that includes you know, pricing your product appropriately, not answering the phone call at three o'clock in the morning, and having rules about cancellations and rescheduling and things like that. And a lot of those things are the reasons why people may start these businesses and quit right away because they don't wanna deal with that stuff or they're not able to be financially successful because they're letting people walk all over them, you know? Yeah, in your book, you definitely go into detail. You talk about how you've been burned over and over. You're, oh, the, yeah. you're the walking case study <laughs> of not having boundaries and you've you fixed it and you show everybody how to do it. But I guess before we go into some of the other uh, mistakes or advice you have for people who want to start their their healing business, I guess the question is, am I a healer? Who's a healer, Jill? How do you know if you're a healer? I love it. I wasn't sure what the title of the book. I'll be honest. I really wrestled with the title of the book because the high income facilitator of healing just didn't come out right. Right. We had to few cut the words up. Basically, I define a healer as anyone who uses their intuition in their business, which means you're energetically tuning in to the person in front of you. So, Miguel, in your case, you probably tune into your guests a little bit, whether you're consciously or aware of it or not. You have to in order to get that pattern right. So we're not stepping on each other's phrases. We're both doing it to each other right now, right? If you're using your intuition in your business, it means you're feeling the other person's emotions a little bit. So if they're angry at you, you're picking up on that. If they're angry at themselves, you're picking up on that. You're also picking up if they're lying to you. But in a way, that energy that they bring to a session can be a little too loud. So it's like listening to Metallica on full blast when you're intuitive, you're going to be feeling things, which you have to, you know, if you're using your intuition for your business, you're automatically turning it on whenever the client walks into the door. And if they're screaming at you, it's going to hit you 10 times harder than it would the average person because you're going to feel it very physically, usually in the heart lung area. So a healer is someone who is using their intuition in their business and they come to the business with a particular set of gifts, but also weaknesses in some ways. Because the, the reason you became intuitive in the first place is usually because of trauma in the home, difficulty in your childhood. A child, I'll tell you how you become a healer. This is how you become a healer. 
it's kind of rare for someone to actually inherit mom and dad's gifts, although some people do. I will say I see more frequently a child like yourself maybe grew up in a household where there was a lot of chaos and a lot of anger, and they autom automatically had an intuitive gift because every kid does. It's their way of being safe, and they turned it up even louder so that when they walked into a room, they could figure out if it was safe to walk across the room or if they should walk around daddy. Oh, dad's drunk. I need to stay away from him right now because he might get violent, right? This is a gift, but it's a curse in a way because later on in life, you're walking into a grocery store and you're feeling all of the energy and the anxiety of all of the people around you in that space. And it can be hard for some people to function. I There's these books out there about highly sensitive person syndrome. I I just hate that word sensitive because I feel like it's just intuitive. It just Let's call it the gift. It's intuitive. If a person is more intuitive, they're going to be picking up on stuff. So a healer is someone who's using their intuition in their business. If I could possibly answer that with any more words, that's how I would say it. <laughs> and it should be mentioned too that as a healer, it's not uh, Jesus heal healing the lepers or you got to be Jill and hypnotizing people. It's a whole variety of things, right? It can be Reiki, massage. I mean, we all, something that speaks to you, but that can help healing, help heal others, right? Absolutely. My hairdresser's a healer. She is, I get a counseling right. session for every like two months. I mean, and she, she dyes my hair too, but you know, that's just a bonus, right? That's a bonus. A healer is someone who's, you, you feel good when you're around them. Um, the mechanic that does my car is in some ways a healer because he says he'll tell me if the car just doesn't sound right. I've actually had one of the mechanics on one of our cars was telling me the colors of the engine weren't right. And he checked it and there was something that the fan, I didn't realize the fan belt was about to crack and break in which on that particular car would have been extremely expensive to repair. Um, you know, that a healer is just someone who does whatever they do in an intuitive way. And it's a lot of people. And also, I will say that not every medical doctor, not everyone who's in a traditionally healing business is a healer, because some of those people can be very robotic, and not necessarily intuitive in the approach that they take. So anytime somebody is, you're working with a practitioner, and they're telling you, I feel like it's this, or it feels like that, or the colors look off or something like that. That person is using their intuition and they're doing it. They're using other gifts that aren't necessarily a lab number on a piece of paper, if that makes sense. Yeah. So basically find your gift. We're all healers, especially for the intuitive kind. And we just need to find this gift and use it. And as I tell people, when you, this is nothing to scoff off because when you see a, your average CEO, they probably have like two life coaches they have a meditation healer they have a hypnotist they have a economics guy i mean they have an army of healers and life coaches because they know these people help their success make sure they stay on the top of the world so this is important we need more healers and there is a a, a business out there for healers especially in silicon valley <laughs> well, and don't forget the psychic that they're also calling. I can I can affirm yeah, that with myself. And the astrologist, <laughs> the yeah, astrologer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I All mean, of they that. know. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's the old saying, uh, and I've said this many times: uh, uh, millionaires don't use astrologer astrology. Billionaires use astrology yeah. because they know it, these modalities, these occult modalities or mystic modal, they work and they work mm -hmm. and they make them very successful and live good lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. That's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to borrow that. I'm going to write that one down and borrow that. That's a great one. Really well, I, I, it's not original as much as my ego wants to make it original, like some quote at the beginning of the interview. But, um, uh, and you said the idea of uh, charging money. What can yes. people do? And I used to have that problem too. I still struggle with it too. I'm like, I'm trying to help people. Isn't that bad? But what helped too is I, I remembered when I would go to AA meetings and of course, you know, you pass the basket and everybody throws their dollar in my sponsor would throw in $20, sometimes $40. And he wasn't like, you know, <laughs> you're making yeah. sure everybody, he just would throw it in there and I'd be like, dude, why are you putting so much money? He's like, the more money I put, the more attention I give. Cause most of us, we throw money and we're want our mind. But if you, if people will buy something from you, or if I pay for something, I will learn a hundred times more. So it's not bad. Money is energy. It's not bad to charge them. In fact, you'll get better results if people pay you. And the thing is the universe requires an exchange. So 
you're giving something in in the form of a gift, a uh, conversation, we insight, wisdom. You're giving them energy in in that form. They have to give you something back in the form of money, perhaps energy in the form of money that you're going to use to to pay your rent. The tough thing is that what I hear from clients is that they think spirit gave me this gift. I shouldn't be the one collecting the money. Spirit gave you that gift so that you could have a nice office, so you could have a nice car, so that you could have an office that you could have clients come to that feel comfortable in your space. They're not feeling creeped out. They want you to have all of these gifts. You get to collect the money. It's all right. It's the bonus. But the exchange has to be there. The universe does require an exchange. I love the idea of skin in the game. That's an important part of it. I will say you're right. People, when they pay a little bit more, will pay more attention to it. But really, it is about I'm giving you this energy in the form of this skill that I developed. Most people, most healers do develop whatever skill they have. I paid for that education to get myself better at it. I'm giving you this gift. Now you're going to give me an exchange of your energy that I'm going to use to pay my car payment (laughs) so that I can drive to the office so that I can have an office so that I can be here so that I can serve others. So I, I've always been troubled by this idea, this very religious concept that God wants us to be poor. That is absolutely not true. God wants us driving a nice car from a nice house and with all the nice things so that we can share those nice things with everyone. That is a part of the process. And please, 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 please don't feel bad for taking an exchange. The person is really required to give it to you. That helps them too. And if you don't accept an exchange, you're messing with the flow of energy and that's not good for either one of you. It's part of the process. And you said about the spirit offering, is that uh, a reason why healers are so bad with marketing? They expect the universe to do it or why are they bad oh with marketing? God. Because I mean, Ooh. you know, your average uh, tele-evangelist, he's good at marketing. Oh, he's good at counting his checks and his money. So why aren't healers good at that like this religious guy? Some of it is is not all of us have marketing skills, right? Like some of the best healers have never taken a marketing class, right? <laughs> it's just part, part of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I love what you just said. The televangelists have no trouble. Your church does not have any trouble asking for money. No problems at all. <laughs> That's what you have to get past and get over. A lot of times healers or intuitive beings tend to be, some of them tend to be a little bit introverted anyway. And so it's tough to put themselves out there on the internet. Also, a lot of healers, I think, particularly women, are a little concerned about every once in a while you hear some story of the Craigslist killer or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like that, that is so rare that, that you would actually put yourself in danger. But people are afraid of the general public. They don't know who's actually going to call. Sometimes, particularly psychics, will end up with people who are genuinely mentally ill calling and, and wanting to know about the alien that's in their house you know, or whatever. Right. Uh, but it is it is really tough. I would say also the wounding that happened from childhood. A lot of times these healers are still wrestling with that voice in their head that says that they're not worthy of money. Who am I to who are you to be asking for any money for this spirit gave you this gift? And I, I, another one I hear a lot of is a hundred dollars is a lot of money. I just can't ask for that. It, it's nothing. The problem that you're solving is worth thousands of dollars to that person in productivity, in loss income in loss uh, life right and and asking for a hundred dollars a session is nothing to to help a person get better from that it's nothing no no not at all uh, again it's that uh, imposter syndrome and that's from what i've read it's not everybody has it everybody oh, yeah, gets everybody those does. i can tell you that just like we all have a p- narcissistic potential or manic Absolutely. we all have it in potential and these things come out so it's how you deal with it. And going back to boundaries, what's some advice you give your clients uh, boundaries, how to, how to create boundaries? Oh my gosh. The number one thing I would say to everyone is don't spend so much time on the freaking phone. Don't spend so much time on the phone. Okay. So the longer you spend in these quote free consults, consulting on the phone, the less likely the client is to book. So if you've spent more than 15 minutes answering questions, that person is not going to book with you. They're going to just at chatter away, ask more questions. They're getting a, f- a mini session from you over the phone. They're going to feel better. And then they're going to feel like they don't need to pay. And then eventually they'll book with somebody else. Maybe somebody who, who says to them, Hey, these are great questions to talk about in your session. My <laughs> online booking system can be found at your perfect w- online booking system.com. Right. That is the number one thing I would say is, is keeping your private time private. Don't call people on the weekends. 
Um, because I, I want people to start to think of healing business as more the way your doctor would think about it. Your doctor will not answer the phone if you call. Your doctor certainly isn't going to answer the call on a weekend or respond to an email that's four pages long. Clients are going to do that. I'm just going to tell you that right now. You'll get a four-page email and you'll think, I don't even know if I want to respond to this, oh, right? I know, I know. But oh, you the, respond and within 20 seconds, they've responded with an even longer it. email. Yep. You're like, yeah, yeah. That's that's the number one reason you don't respond to those right away. I will say at least three days and usually something to the effect of this is something great that we should talk about in session. Here's the link to book. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a big, big, big issue. People get into this what I call free consult trap, free consult trap. The first session needs to be a paid session because they got something out of it. And that again, that exchange needs to happen. The person feels better. They may never call you again because they felt better and you didn't get anything from that session. You need to be charging right away the same way as your doctor would. And if your doctor doesn't cure you, your doctor is still going to charge you. They're still, you know, if, if you don't, you leave their office and you don't feel better, you're still getting charged. That's the way we need to approach our business too, because sometimes it's not about the practitioner actually most of the time, it's about the person's willingness to receive help, their following of your advice, their ready, willing and ableness to receive help and get help. It's really about the client ultimately anyway makes sense and uh what else what some advice you give people to get into that sort of uh success mindset to what some what has worked for you i love reading i love reading self-help books <laughs> I'm, I a bit of a junkie. Yeah. I'm a bit of a junkie <laughs> i love i love getting into those mindset books um there's some great ones out there like you know, just old school, uh, rich dad, poor dad, um, sometimes cheap seminars. I wouldn't say spend a ton of money on these things, but really the other thing too, that I found helpful when I first started my business was to join like a networking group, like one of those more hardcore ones, like BNI or Latip, one of the ones that are, you know, they're a little more expensive, but you are, com you really committed on a different level. That's helpful because you get to be around other very successful business owners. And when you first start and you have new clients, it's, it's very helpful to actually see somebody who's further ahead down the trail. The other thing with those groups too, is that at least for me, when I first started, I didn't have any, I didn't have any clients. It was helpful to come in with a problem to one of these meetings and say, Hey, I don't know what to do about this thing. And then I suddenly have 25 people offering me advice. Some of it was good. Some of it was, well, free <laughs> advice is free, <laughs> but it was, it was always helpful. I would say that is a big key is to be around people that are far more successful than yourself. The other thing I would say is very helpful is to stay away from family. I hate to say this, some family of origin that's not supportive, the family of origin that tells you you just need to stay at your job and maybe you'll be a manager someday and you'll get that extra 25 cent raise, you know, whatever. That's <laughs> not the family you wanna hang around with. You wanna hang around with people that are more successful than yourself, that expect success to happen to them and you want to adopt their habits and their mindset. That's what you got to do. No, makes sense. And uh, for the, for the audience, uh, the income healer has a lot more. And, and in fact, Jill takes you step by step. First, the office, then we're going to the social media. To what are we going to do to get clients? The whole work, and it can be done today. Again, there is a need. God knows, there's a need. People need healing more than ever in the 2023. And uh, things, right, can be done remotely. It's not the day you don't even have to have an office. I mean, I have non-local healers that use different things. Uh, can hypnotism be done? Does it have to be done in person? Actually, hyp hypnosis is actually better done via, I use Zoom, uh, via done remotely because a person is actually in their own house. They're more relaxed. Sometimes they have the cat on their lap. Yeah. Um, sometimes if they have kids and, and that being able to leave the house and leave the kids is an impediment. So if the kids are in the other room, it's fine. But you, actually doing that virtually is more effective because to me, for, for them, I'm just a voice. They're not thinking about my office. They didn't have to fight traffic. They didn't have to, there's this strange smell in my office that they're, you know I mean? The incense that I burn before they come, right? All of this stuff, they're in their own space and they're in their own element. I will say, especially for psychic readings, it's actually so much easier to do those remotely. The psychics will tell you, cause you can just get more information cause they really are, you can just really tune in and all the distractions of the environment are not there. So it's, 
very easy to do those things remotely. I hate, I, I'm sorry for the people like the massage therapists, the clients that touch people that actually have to see. I haven't seen a client in person in over three years because of the pandemic. And before that, half of my clients were remote anyway. So it really can be done and it can be done well remotely. Agreed. And uh, since, well, I guess I would say not since the pandemic started, I, as I have my weird theory that our, the universe broke down after David Bowie died in 2016 <laughs> or or the Mayan 2012 actually were just feeling the start of it. It's, you know, I, I'm making stories up, but 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 I'm stick. But we know society and reality is just cracking around us. That's a fact. What are some of the more issues that you have with clients? Do you see anything as change? Any sort of what's your uh, state of the union for the mental health of society today? Is it? I'm I'm actually really pleased by a lot of what I'm seeing. I will tell you that, and it's not. I mean, I'm good. I'm better better than I was ten years ago, right? Mm -hmm. But setting that idea aside, people are coming in with a a higher degree of spiritual development than what I was seeing before. People are coming in, they're getting healed faster. I'm having clients come in for some issues that I would never even contemplate before. Like, like I've had clients come in because they've got a child who's transitioning and they want help using the right pronouns because they can never think of their, the person that was born a daughter as a son, they have trouble with that. And so I'm, I'm like, wow, we are really evolving past some of our prejudices. If people are coming in to learn how to to create better pronouns and have a better relationship with their children. I don't see that getting worse. I'm seeing people coming in who are much more intuitive. I know everybody talks about the kids being more psychic than they used to. I'm actually seeing more that the parents of these children are more intuitive and more in touch with their own spirituality. And so they're making it easier for people who have natural gifts to develop those. I am seeing a lot more people hearing about some weird class they saw on meetup and going, yeah, that sounds strange. I think I'll take it, you know, try some <laughs> <laughs> aliens. And how do you do aliens? All of that stuff. People are learning lots of new things. I also will say now I'm not a doctor, so don't consider this medical advice. I will say that I am encouraged by some of the medicinal medications, the natural things that I'm seeing uh, starting to be on the market more and starting to be done with, you know, with the help of a shaman. Um, I'm seeing more of those psychotropic products being used in a different way and in a more therapeutic way with the help of qualified practitioners. I'm encouraged by that because I do think particularly for our veterans that these people really can be helped with some of these natural plant medicines. I'm encouraged by that. So I'm, I'm happy with what I'm seeing. I will say that. Good, good. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good time to pivot and... I don't think we have a choice if we want to get better. It's, that's why I call this Finding Hermes, the god of the doorways, the liminal spaces, the crossroads. I mean, this is the time. If you want to make a move, this is the time to do it. So we ain't going back to 2019, as I no, tell No, it's people. over. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I do love, I also love that people are really embracing this idea of a side hustle, of a cottage home-based business, of embracing the idea that their only money doesn't have to come from their you know, boss or corporate boss. People are starting to become a little bit more independent in that respect. And I love that. I really love buying candles from somebody who's making them in their kitchen in their spare time. I love that. And I think more and more people are doing that, making yogurt and, and bread and things that we used to only buy in the store. Now people are doing it at home. And I'm, I'm impressed and I'm happy to see more and more of that. Yeah, and with technology, it's a lot easier. E-commerce, connecting with others. Uh, yeah, and it's a good time to do that and make technology work for you in a good way. And again, your book uh, certainly addresses how to make technology life so much easier as you're a solopreneur or whatever the concept, whatever it's called these days. Awesome. Well, for the audience uh, who might, who are listening to this right now in just the audio version, of course, I'll have it on the show notes, but in audio, tell people where to find out more about you and your services. 
So my website is jillkthomas.com and my name is Jill K. Thomas. Uh, I couldn't get the Jill Thomas. I was already taken. So it's jillkthomas.com and that's that's the first lesson for any budding healer. Buy your own name. Trust me on this one, buy your own name. <laughs> so no matter what your modality ends up being, you're going to want your name because you're going to want to brand it with that. So in jillkthomas.com, you can buy my book, The High Income Healer on Amazon. And if you can't remember the title, just go to my website. You, click, click, and it'll take you right to Amazon and you can buy the book. So that's how you find me. Yeah. And she's got a lot of cool resources on her uh, website, uh, other audio video, and yeah, just a, a fun uh, website to go to. And yeah, that's interesting because just last week, Jill, I, I realized that I needed another website because the God above God and Gnosticism wasn't going to be good for my voiceover services. If I want to get hired by, you know, evangelical or other more conservative people so i went and miguel connor still available <gasps> miguel connor doc i couldn't believe it i was like Lucky. i'm gonna have to think of like miguel connor voice or miguel connor pro i was like oh my god you're so lucky <laughs> yes please if you're listening right now if you're th even thinking about getting into healing arts buy your own name it'll be please. like seven dollars a year yeah <laughs> it's a, an investment yeah yeah for so and you never know, the person with your name might become, another person might become the next, I don't know, uh, Michael Jackson or Taylor Swift, and they might buy the name from you for a million dollars down I the road. I would totally welcome that. I would absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I was more concerned that somebody would buy it and put a porn site up, but to be honest with you, that probably actually help me. <laughs> as long as you get a, you get a slice, <laughs> you get a, cut, a little cut, so... Uh, awesome. Well, Jill, it's been a great conversation. Uh, we hope to have you in the future. And yeah, good luck with everything. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Miguel. I appreciate it.